Tim Sturdivant. I'm a member here at First Southern. Pastor asked me if uh, I would bring the message today. Uh, I'm fighting, screaming, and kicking going into the digital age. Now, I know how to build a computer. I know how to fix them when something goes wrong. But when it comes to me using it to preach, it's a little, a little hard. So I'm going to try it. Last time I tried it, my tablet went blank. And I had to uh, just buy shirt tail do that. The year was 1958. We had sang three songs. We had the offering. My sister sang the special. And then it was my time to get up and preach my first sermon. My text was John 3.16a, For God so loved the world. And I remember that message as if I did it this morning. It was, God loves you, and he wants you to love him back. And that was it. Now, don't get too excited that you're going to get out early and be able to beat the Methodists or the Presbyterians to the restaurant. Because I went to college to become a minister. They taught us how to take that same verse, that same message, and turn it into 20 30, even 45 minutes. Now, I don't know how long, how long do I have? Hour and a half, did you say? <laughs> we, uh, the past few weeks, Pastor has been preaching on Hebrews 11. And the uh, first Part of that was what verse 1 through 3 is, faith requires trust. And that wasn't too bad for me. I, I got through that one with, uh, with not too much trouble. Then the second week was verse 4 through 6. Through faith, we can leave a legacy. I was okay with that because I preached to my kids. I preached to my grandkids. I preached to people that I work with. So I was okay on that one. The next one was on verse 7, just verse 7. Faith requires commitment. Wow. That one kind of hurt. Well, commitment... For some things was easy, but some it really wasn't. And he talked about being committed to this church. You know, it'd be great if he would say, okay, I don't need everybody coming to me and volunteering. I've got enough. But they taught us in, in school that only 10% of the members are the ones that do everything. Only 10%. Now, if you have a church of 60, that's only six people. Then in this next week was verses 8 through 22. Faith gives us hope for the future. And I, well, that one was okay, too, because I know I have put my faith in Jesus Christ, and I know where my future is at. So today, we're going to be studying verses 23 to 31. Faith through perseverance. I thought about, too, as first, my first title was Faith through enduring. Same thing. And so we're going to talk a little bit about faith of Moses' parents. 
Moses himself, the people of Israel, and Rahab. Almost 400 years has passed since Joseph was in Egypt and he, uh, the Pharaoh that was happening at that time hated the Israelites. In fact, he noticed that they were growing really rapidly and he was starting to worry about them. So then he turned the, them into slaves. And then he asked his people to kill all the born babies, boys. And so that's where we're going to start. So if you would uh, take your Bibles and stand with me as we read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 through 31. All right, already lost my place. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. And in some translations, he was a handsome or beautiful child. And they were not afraid, afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people. God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a, of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead for his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, he preserved because he, because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in these next few minutes. May I be that instrument for you to speak through. May these be not my words, but may they be yours. Just guide and direct and undertake and May our hearts, ears be opened, that we may hear your word and apply it to our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Amen. You may be seated. Amram and Jochebed. We don't hear much about those, but that was Moses' parents. And they were from the tribe of Levi. And I thought it was interesting, as I was doing my study, that Jochebed, which is the lady, was um, Amram. I have trouble saying Amram. I don't have trouble with Jochebed, but I do with Amram. But anyway, Amram's father's sister is who Jochebed was and so Amram married Jochebed his basically his aunt now back then uh, the man had several wives and so this was probably Amram's uh, step or not step half aunt I don't know how you can split an aunt but <laughs> anyway and so they were married and uh, they, she was, uh, she had Miriam, and then she was pregnant again, and she was pregnant with Moses. Now, back then, they didn't have sonograms, and so they couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl until they were born. And when they found out that he was born, and that he was handsome, and I thought, you know, well, in some of the 
translations as I was looking at them. That handsome, beautiful, ordinary, even one said funny. And I, from the same translation, but he was handsome. And I, in, in my studies too, I found that there were only six men in the Bible that was mentioned that were handsome. And Moses was one of them. Saul was one of them. David was one of them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Daniel. And there was one more. Absham. Abisham. I guess I'm, my math is not good. At first they said there were only four, but then when I was looking, I found Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel were also said were handsome. But anyway, they knew that Moses was special, that God had something in mind for Moses. So they hid him for three months, and I think... They were thinking, okay, that we probably can't hide him any longer. And so she knew that Pharaoh's daughter would go down to the, to the Nile and bathe on this certain day at this certain time. And so what she did was she weaved a basket, put him in it, and had Miriam take him down and put him in the Nile the day that Pharaoh's daughter would go down and bathe and so she put him in there and kind of pushed him and he started crying and she heard his cry and she sent one of her handmaidens to go find out what's going on there and took him and she seen how beautiful he was and she thought I need to keep him I can adopt him he can be my son and so she named him Moses, which means drawn out of water. And so he grew up and he had the best scholars, the best food, and he had, was in line basically for the throne. And so he grew up there. And we don't know how long all of a sudden from him being in the, uh, being picked out of the, out of the Nile until he comes and decides that he needs to be with his people. And I'm sure in that time God had been talking to him and telling him, that I have a plan for you. And so he trusted God and went to be with his people. Now I don't know, I kind of interject on this one, but when he was down he saw an, an Egyptian beating on an Israelite. And he went over and killed him. Well, at first he looked to see if anybody was around, and they weren't, so he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. I wonder what would have happened if he had not killed that man. Would have he then been able to take the people out of bondage earlier? Um... That's my thought of what would happen. But he didn't. And then the next day, there were two Israelites fighting, and he went to break it up. And so they said, what are you going to do, kill us like you did that Egyptian? And he thought, man, I, I didn't think anybody saw me. But he didn't remember, he didn't, Remember that 
the Egyptian was beating on an Israelite. And maybe that Israelite's the one that told people that, hey, Moses killed this guy. Well, Pharaoh finds out, and when Moses finds out, Pharaoh had found out, he left. He flees. Now, when we think of that, we think of that he was frightened and left. But it tells us here that he did not fear Pharaoh. And so then he went to Median and met these ladies at a well and helped them feed their flocks. And then he was invited to the, the Median's home and got a job being a shepherd. And that's when he came across the burning bush. And he noticed that the bush was burning, but it was never being consumed. So he thought, I'm going to go over there and take a look. And all of a sudden, God speaks to him from that burning bush. I don't know about you, but uh, if a burning bush was talking to me, I think I'd turn and run. And maybe he knew that that was God's voice. Now, we have to go back and remember that when he said that, you know, he was not a, a good speaker, we have to remember that when he was growing up, he was in an Egyptian home, and they spoke Egyptian as pre-Arabic time. And so he, his first language was Egyptian and then he started learning Hebrew and uh, if he was like me it takes time for me to translate for what I want to say in another language but it's usually I'm trying to figure out how to say it in English I tell everyone I needed to have back when I was going to school English as a second language and people would say, well, what is your first language? And I said, I don't have one. And so I think that's the reason why he was having trouble to be able to speak to, to the Israeli people. But he had faith in God. He had a staff that God told him, pick up, take that staff and drop it down, and it, it turned to a serpent. And then he says, now pick it up. And it was like, well, I would go, I'm not picking that thing up. Because snakes are slimy as far as I'm concerned. A good snake to me, besides bull snakes, is a dead snake. So anyway, he picked it up, and it turned back to the right. He had faith that God would take care of him. And so he went back to Egypt. And he had the faith in God to go to Pharaoh and tell him that he needs to let God's people go. And we won't go through all the plagues and everything, but it was because of his faith in God that these plagues happened. It was by faith when he'd heard that and told the Israeli people that the death angel was coming and you needed to put the lamb's blood around the, the door frame. The people of Israel had faith that they knew that if that blood was there, that they would be safe. And if it wasn't there, then the firstborn would die. So we know that Israel had faith. And, and then as they were leaving, and they were going across, getting ready to cross the Red Sea, they had faith for the Red Sea parted. 
and they walked across on dry land. Now I was curious, so I went and looked up to see how many people of the Israelite clan were there. And it says that when they left, there were 600,000 men. And so some scholars took to, that could be 1 million people to 2.5 million people, plus all their flocks. And to cross that on dry land. Now I can, when I think about that, and then they're, they're walking and walking in there and there, you have these walls of water. I can see some little kid, I know my grandkids would, they would go up to the side and they'd flick that water. And I'm sure adults, and I probably would have been one of them, I would have went over there and flicked it. Just to, This is amazing. They had great faith. They had great faith when they were told to walk around the walls of Jericho. They didn't know why they were walking around, but they were told and they had faith in God that they walked around. And on that seventh day, they were told to walk seven times. And you think, well, we've been only walking around it one day, once a day. Why are we doing seven? But their faith in God, they did, and the walls fell down. How big is your faith? Six years ago, I was told that I had stage four cancer of my right kidney. Now my daughter, being a medical person, knew what the chances are on stage four clear cell carcinoma. It wasn't much. And when I heard, when the doctor told me, I hate to tell you this, but you have cancer. And I didn't say it out loud, but I, inside it says, well, God, you have a problem. And I left it in his hands. Not one time did I worry that whatever happened was his will for my life. And last month I had my sixth year checkup and five years since chemo, and it's clear I have no cancer. It's because my faith in God. But you know the funny thing is, is that was a big deal. But you know when little things happen, then I start worrying. I have faith for the big things, but I kind of lack faith in the little things. How is it in your life? Are there things going on in your life that you think is too big for you to handle? Well, and it may be, but it's not too big for God. If he can take and split the Red Sea, if he can take a rod and lay it down and it turn to a serpent, or take that and... Moses was supposed to wave it across a rock for water, but he didn't. He, his faith wasn't very big that day, and he hit the rock. Can you imagine what would have happened, and we were studying this in Sunday school this morning, that God had a plan for Israel to live in a utopia, and yet they had faith to walk through that Red Sea, but they didn't have faith that God would take care of them. 
in Israel. And so they, as it, some of the scripture says, that they were sick, stiff-necked people. How is it in your life? Rahab, the prostitute, was spared her life because she helped the spies. She had faith in the God of Israel. Sometime, somewhere, God called you to be his child. God has called every one of us to ministry. It's not to be a preacher. It may be a Sunday school teacher. It may be a nursery worker. It may be a greeter. It may be calling on people. Some of you aren't listening to God's calling. Because you think, well, I don't have faith to do that. I'm not qualified to be a teacher. I'm not qualified to be a greeter. I was told when I was younger, God does not call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And if some of the stories that I was talking about that you really didn't know about is things that I learned in Sunday school. Are you in Sunday school learning more about the Bible? Are you bringing your kids to Sunday school so they can learn this lesson about Moses in, in the Nile? About faith? I think about when we were talking about, when Pastor was talking about Noah. Building this humongous ark, that'd be like building one here in western Kansas. So why in the world are you building a boat out here? It's because of the faith. Hebrews 11 is called the hall of faith. Of all of these people. And the reason why it's here was not for just the, the Hebrews. It was here for us. Everything in this Bible is God's holy word. Everything in here is for us. Jesus told us that if we had faith of a mustard seed, now I've seen a mustard seed, and it's very small. In fact, I even looked it up to see how big it was. It is 0 .039 to 0 .079 in diameter. And I didn't do the math on that of how many seeds it would take to make a square inch. But it would be, what, 390? In, in one inch. That we could, he told us that if we had faith of that mustard seed, that we could say to that mountain, go from here to there, and it would. Or I think it's in Luke. He said, if you had faith of a mustard seed, you could tell that mulberry tree to uproot and go into the sea, and it would. Faith of a mustard seed. Can you imagine if we only even had half that much faith? What 
we could do. And it wouldn't really be us, it would be God using us. How's your faith? Are you listening to what God wants you to do? Maybe some of you here say, I don't have enough faith that God would save me from my sins. I've done so many bad things, and I'm trying to straighten out, and when I get straightened out, then I'll commit myself to Jesus Christ. Well, friends, that's not the way it works. There's an old hymn that said, Just as I am, without one plea, that that thy blood was shed for me. I used to uh, go out on concerts and sing. And one of the songs that I sang was, I was always on his mind. That when he was on that cross, he looked ahead to the future and he saw me. And he saw you. And he said, this is the, I'll take Tim's sin and place it on myself. I'll take those others and take them upon myself. And you know, he would loved us so much that he died on the cross just for me. He died on the cross just for you. And if it was only one person that would be saved for him dying on the cross, he would have gone and done that. He has done so much for us. How much have we done for him? What is your calling? Is he calling you today to become that Christian that he wants you to be? Is he calling you to be in Sunday school? Is he calling you to be a Sunday school teacher? Is he calling you to be a greeter? Is he calling you into the ministry and to be a pastor? He's calling every one of us. And we are somewhere in that. He is calling all of us into his service. And all we have to have is faith. Would you stand with me?